Hi, I'm Brian. Welcome to Alto Gafool. So, you love driving a coupe, but you want the space and practicality of an SUV. Can it be done? Mercedes say it can. Let's take a closer look and find out. When Mercedes launched the GLE Coupe, a lot of people weren't entirely convinced by the idea. I have to be honest, I was included amongst those people. Why? Well, a coupe is a unique driving style. It's a really special type of car. An SUV almost seems to be a complete contradiction of most of that. So when the GLE Coupe came along, largest Mercedes wheels ever featured on a car, it felt to me a lot like a style statement. I couldn't really see exactly how you would carry over the characteristics of the one to the other, at least not necessarily successfully. Well, there you go. I'm not right about everything all the time. It was a very popular car and popular enough, in fact, to convince Mercedes that what it deserved was a complete makeover. That is what we are here to take a look at today. This is the brand new GLE Coupe. And when I say brand new, I really mean it. A lot has changed here. Where the predecessor was based on the standard GLE platform, just really with aesthetic tweaks to it, this is a completely new design. So the chassis is different this time from the GLE. Hopefully that will take care of some of those standard complaints about limited space in the back. The performance and the technology has been completely overhauled, meaning that the driving experience of this, according to Mercedes, is gonna be a lot closer to what you would expect from a coupe type performance. Well, we're gonna take a closer look and find out, but for now, let's start off with that styling. Bang! Well, I'm pretty sure you can imagine the first thing that they're going to want you to feel as a customer is that this is making a very different statement from the GLE. And right from the get-go, right from the first glance at the front here, you can see that this is making a very bold statement. From the eyes at the front here, which are now standard as full LEDs, to this massive combination of traditional Mercedes stars. We have the starburst grille, but also this very familiar horizontal bar and the massive Mercedes logo in the front. Everything here is designed to go bang and really hit you in the face. It's big, it's solid, it's bold, but it changes its styling as we come slightly higher up. Look at the sleekness of the way these lines draw up through into the bonnet to the visual of the windshield. Clearly, this is supposed to look a lot more svelte than a traditional SUV. And there are two key reasons for that. The first is a lot of the aerodynamic redesigning that's gone on with this car. It's now 9% more efficient driving through the air. And that means that we have a much flatter windshield at the front. So to make that work from a styling point of view, it's important to move through from the boldness of that front design and then sleek out the design a little bit as we come up into the elegant lines of the top of this roof. Let's see how that's affected what the side looks like. Four meters 93 in length or 194 inches. This is where the styling makes a very solid statement of difference. So we've got to start with the most obvious point. Let's look at these wheels. Well, they are running 19 to 22 inches and I think in terms of making the styling work, it really is worthwhile looking at the largest possible wheels for this car. Before I get a thousand comments saying, but they're not usually the best, I will say if you're buying the coupe, styling is clearly very important to you. And I think you have to agree, these massive wheels really feel at home within this design. Now, if this is looking a little bit different from the coupe of the last generation, that's because we have a larger, 
length to this car now. There's more room to play around with on the chassis, but don't be fooled into thinking it's just a standard GLE again. It's 60 millimeters, and that's around about that much yeah, around about that much shorter on the wheelbase than the GLE. The reason for that change is to add to the agility in the handling and the drive of the car. But in terms of the styling, I don't think it hurts it at all either. I'm just going to walk across to the front and you can see that the way that this roof line pulls straight through into the back. It really changes the aggression of the front of this vehicle into a more elegant swooping roof line and sideways appearance. Now, these foot plates on the side are optional. I'm going to say I think it looks slightly better with the more discreet styling of the appearance after all. Although that reinforces the fact it is still an SUV, for my taste, if you're going to go with the coupe line on this, you want as much elegance as you can cram into it. After all, the cars you're referencing, well, you're not going to find one of those that has a foot plate. Two meters or 79 inches in width. The back of this car is now seven millimeters and that's approximately the width of your thumb wider than the predecessor. And this is where we get to what I would describe as being the taste splitter. If you're gonna go with a coupe SUV, you're gonna have that nice looking roof line, but it is gonna leave you with something of a challenge at the rear. And that's why we have this massive rear section. Now that's not all for aesthetic purposes. The load space in the boot is larger. We'll get to look at that in just a bit. Also, the load width is slightly wider and because of customer feedback, as you can see here, a standard problem for coupe SUVs is that they have very high entrance points. This has now dropped. And if you go with the Airmatic suspension that's available, you can drop it even further still. So it should be much easier to get that load into. But none of that really affects what I'm around here to talk about. And that is the aesthetic of the rear. So I called it a taste splitter. I think I'm gonna stick with that. You're either really gonna look at this and think, yes, that's my car, or you're gonna look at it and say, no. Where do I sit on that spectrum? Well, I think you have to take it for what it is, and that is a coupe SUV. And within those terms, I think it's finished off nicely. I like the way that the back comes across in a nice, easy way. This is a massive rear. It's not my car. It's not quite my taste, but I'd be really keen to know what you think. Let's take a look in the back. Well, we now have 655 to 1,790 litres of load space back here, and that is 70 litres more than the predecessor. I think I'm going to cut quite a lot of slack for this car in terms of the rear design for quite what's been achieved here. Let's not forget that reduction in aerodynamic or in increase in the uh, aerodynamic coefficient. That results not only in a more fuel efficient car, but it also means that the ride noise inside is actually fantastically low. And that is a really big advantage. So I will put up with quite a bit of bulbous back in order to accept two things. One, better aerodynamic performance and two, increased load space. Let's have a look here to see exactly what we've got. Well, that is a massive boot at the back. There is plenty of load space and I can tell you that now, if you fold down those seats to get the maximum load in there, you have up to two meters in length. That is huge. And the load space across is over a meter in width. So you actually have plenty of room to fit anything. Those fairly justifiable complaints about the load height have also been addressed really successfully here. I am not the world's tallest person. And as you can see from my hip height, that's going to be very easy, even for a slightly older customer who's trying to put things in the back to manage to take care of that. If you're concerned about that, don't forget if you go with the Airmatic suspension, and really if you're springing for one of these, I'm going to say go the whole hog because you can't get the full tech package unless you go with that that's going to mean that you can drop this even lower still, making loading into the rear of it actually a fairly straightforward proposition.
Well, ordinarily at this point, we're showing you inside the car and today's no exception, but we're going to start with the back. Why? Well, my number one bugbear about the first generation of this car was the headroom in the rear. The reason being, you cannot put a coupe line on any car without compromising the space for the rear seat passenger. And the reason that it upset me so much in this car is that it's an SUV. So I have to be able to travel with rear seat passengers. Otherwise, there's literally no point in the vehicle. So I'm five feet 10 or 178 centimeters, but I do have a particularly large torso. So you can compare my available headspace with somebody around about six foot in height. <sighs> and I am very happy to tell you that thanks to the new chassis, thanks to the redesign, I am very, very happy and comfortable back here indeed. That is a huge leap forwards. That means that Mercedes can make the claim you can have a coupe line SUV and get the best of both worlds when it comes to space. Am I comfortable back here? Yes. Do I have everything I need? Yes. Could I fit three adults back here? You know what? Yes. So it's all good in the back. How is it looking in the front? Well, of the compromises that I had with the predecessor, I was always pretty happy with both the drive and the appearance and styling of the interior. Mercedes certainly know how to finish a car and make it look pretty nice, and this is no exception. Everything's a little bit more updated, as is always the case with Mercedes. The options you can have are almost limitless. So if you're looking at this and you're thinking, oh, I'm more of a wood guy, or oh, I think I'd prefer lighter or darker or different materials, Honestly, you're going to be able to find exactly what you want within the lineup. So this is only this particular style. It suits my taste. I like the mixture of metal effects, actual metal and nicely finished fabrics. Stitching looks good. Everything is designed for practicality. Look at those door pockets in the front. Hooray! We do gain some benefits from having the SUV styling over a standard coupe after all. And there it is. Let's have a look and see how comfortable the car is. And Thomas, I might just need to switch it off so I can stop it talking to me while I'm going about it. Then again, it might just need to keep talking to me anyway. Well, as you would expect, I have ample room here. I have more than enough headspace and this car comes with a panoramic roof. And as you know, you always lose a little bit of room for that. What's changed in terms of the design aesthetic within here is that because this platform was designed as a standalone vehicle and not just an adaption of a GLE, everything in here looks as if it should be here. It doesn't look like an adaption. It looks as if it's specifically designed to be in this car. I would use the words elegant, svelte, understated. If you're a fan of the GLE, you'll find plenty in here to recognize and just as much to like. Of all of the manufacturers, I think Mercedes do integration of their top end infotainment system better than anyone else now. I am keen to hear, however, what you think. But this screen is the latest and greatest, the sharpest, highest resolution, most responsive. I'm not going to bore you with the numbers, but I will tell you that the way that it appears and the way that it behaves, excellent. If you're like me and sometimes bothered by too much digital within a car, you'll be pleased to see how tastefully this has been integrated into the design. It looks and feels really nice, and it's actually very pleasant to see the way that it's all been worked into the design. It's important to mention that this is a pre-production car and because of that, some things, some small details will be changed before this car is actually ready to be produced and sold. One of those things that I have that I really hope does get changed are these stalks here. It's a small detail, but it's a very expensive car, although we don't have final confirmation on those numbers. I'm always a bit confused with Mercedes, how they managed to do such a fantastic job on the finishing and details 99% of the time, and then they just let themselves down a little bit with these small touches. In such a nicely finished car, it really stands out. It wouldn't stand out in any other vehicle. It's just that it's in such contrast to everything else that's happening here. So a minor niggle could just be a pre-production thing, but I think it's worth pointing out just so you can see, I'm not only a fanboy for this car in particular. Now let's have a look slightly lower down. 
I'm really liking this solid design here. This is really reflecting the SUV character. Everything is really nicely integrated with internal lighting. You can see a little bit of that just here. Obviously, that's fully adaptable to your personal taste. I have driven in this car in the night and it works really nicely for creating an ambient atmosphere that suits your style and your taste. Here at Outtaker Fuel, we like to bring you things as soon as we're possibly capable of doing it. And sometimes that means that we're not even allowed to drive the products ourselves. So we have somebody to drive us around and show us this product, but we don't just have anyone. We have Andreas Seigen with us today, and he is the head of development for SUVs at Mercedes. So if anyone should know the answer to my questions, this guy should be it. Now, I want to start off by saying the GLE Coupe. When that was introduced, well, it was a little bit of a head turner. I think it's fair to say that all car design is an intersection between form and functionality. And the GLE Coupe was a little bit of a challenge when it came to functionality. So there were a huge amount of potential options when it came to rethinking it once it had proved that it had some market value. So what did you come to when you started with that blank sheet of paper for this car? <laughs> well, uh, when we started with a blank sheet of papers, it was originally with the GLE. So the GLE is a uh, is, uh, um, basic of the platform of our Mercedes-Benz modular high architecture. And when we created this car, we have to, um, we must think about every variant which will come in the future so that the basic version includes all the stuff you see here now in the GLE coupe also and which is, which you have seen in the GLS or in the basic GLE and therefore it was a better situation than with the first GLE coupe from Mercedes which was uh, which was created on a platform which was a little bit older and so it was restricted with this car, we have no limits, so we can totally focus on what is what a GLE Coupe really needs, what is what will our customer make happy when driving this car, and therefore we can, we can, we have developed all these stuff which I want to show you today, and that you feel that the GLE Coupe is more than a body and bite by Ryan. Well, I'm really excited to hear you say that. I think that a lot of people, myself included were really quite surprised by just how popular the predecessor to this car was. Yeah. So it's really exciting to see what can be achieved when you have a little less in the way of restriction to development. So a lot has changed for yes. this car. Yeah. Talk me through some of those changes. Good. The biggest change, and that is maybe <laughs> the first and important message is we have our own wheelbase for the coupe. We'll have a 60 millimeters less wheelbase than the GLE. So that was the first and important issue regarding to the design because the coupe has to be more sporty. It has to look like more, maybe something aggressive, but we want to create a beauty, right? A beauty in this car, which really has a big difference to the normal GLE. And so the wheelbase was very important. So I guess the sporty dynamic of the appearance the design idea behind decreasing that wheelbase is to try and bring the sporty dynamic into the drive to match that appearance yes yes you're right and Excellent. it's of course the agility of a car is based on the wheelbase so therefore as longer it's very it's based on more comfort so that was the reason why we increased the wheelbase for the Geely or for the GLS because the main issue for these cars are comfort and roominess now you just hit the nail on the head. We've come to the roads in the mountains outside of Sibiu and that's in Romania. And I would say that's very famous for two things in particular. The one is extremely beautiful roads to drive. And the second, if I'm being bluntly honest, is that they're not always in the best condition. So this offers us the opportunity to see both the sporty and agile handling of the car, but also whether it can still deliver deliver the level of comfort yeah. that people have come to expect. Yeah. And I hope fully you feel it because we are driving here in a curve mode right now, very smoothly on very rough roads here. 
and you don't feel that the car is like moving the body and so on and even here in the curves you feel it it's very stable uh, the body in white is very stable and the whole body is very stable so therefore even we drive with 22 inch wheels those are still the largest wheels available yeah. for any Mercedes, right? Uh, not. The GLS is available with 23-inch wheels with a diameter of 825 millimeters. Wow. Okay. I think 22 is probably going to be big <laughs> enough for me. Now, this car is also now available with a different engine lineup. What are we driving in here right now? So, we are driving the 400D the uh, six-cylinder inline diesel engine with here because we have the e-active body control uh, in the car with a 48 voltage system so that gives us a, a little boost an electric boost on the uh, as well. no this uh, is diff something different to the gasoline engines where we have the 48 voltage system with the integrated starter generator so this gives us a boost here we have two electrical system on board because we need the 48 voltage for the power, it's powered the EABC system. So therefore, ah. we have in addition to the normal 12 volt system, this 48 volt system on board. So that needs the power, for example, here to move the body in, in the curve that we drive a little bit like a, a, a motorcycle, you know? It's not going in the, in the direction like a car normally it goes, it goes inside to the curve and stabilize the body. And thanks to that new system, you now have available 100% of the power on each of the wheels. Is that correct? Exactly. That makes a significant difference to Absolutely. the agility in the hand. There's no rolling bar. So this system is four separate wheels. So they operating absolutely no combination, no influence between right side, left side. It just stabilized by the camera view, which you see here with scan the road and therefore you see how the system is operating mm. and stabilize the car when we're now turning here into the right corner. It's a very clever engineering trick because it does provide you with a lot more comfort than you traditionally would expect exactly. from such a high up vehicle. That's the reason why we are, this, this, this road here is, it's only, it's only curved. Mm. So, and we can have a very good interview without any problems. <laughs> There speaks a man of plenty of experience of talking about <laughs> race circuits, I'm guessing. Now, one thing that immediately strikes me about this as being distinct and different from the predecessor is that I feel there's a lot more space in here. So we have more width and length as well. And that over the platform gives us a lot more interior room. Was that a very conscious decision to accompany the geometry of the chassis? Um, well, it is. it is a little bit based on the design you know that is how the the strengths of the car so from the exterior to the interior and we want to have with this car a very strong picture on the road the appearance should be really wow when you are following the car it's clear you clear uh, you see this is a mercedes coupe it is our design family so therefore we increase the wheel the wheel bit and all the width of the car so you see it with the claddings and the fender that if you compare it to the GLE you, you don't have really big uh, fender flares right it's very small yes and that gives of, of course the uh, opportunity to increase the interior spaciness a little bit uh, but the biggest effort for our customer is that we have nearly 30 millimeters more space in the second row even we know that for a coupe the second row is not so important before like like uh, the GLS or the GLE but as always that fight between form and function I know that you've reduced the wind resistance of the coupe by nine percent is that correct yeah we in in, in numbers we reduce 30 points so the old one has a, a drag coefficients from point zero point three five and the new one is 0 0.32. That's remarkable. How did you achieve that without compromising the interior? Well, it's a long of, it's not only one countermeasure, you know. It's a work in the wind channel, wind tunnel. It's real hours for hours to optimize every little spoiler, you know, every little surface a little bit. And therefore, step by step, we are working point by point. So 30 points was the, the optimization was 30 points left than the predecessor. So you need 30 issues, 30 points, a long way. But 
it works. So it must kill you a little bit inside when you see people who put things on the roof of these things <laughs> when they're driving along. You think you have no idea how hard we worked yeah, yeah, to yeah. make that work the way it's supposed to. Yes, you're right. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, so I know you can't give me an answer to this question, but maybe a, a hint. Obviously, we've got new technology all over the place. We have a new custom-built chassis. We have a new engine lineup. All of that sounds to me like it's going to be costing me more money. Now, the rumor is the price point should stay similar. Is can you can you give me a hint? I, I really I'm I'm head of development, not head oh. of sales. <laughs> so therefore, this is a task. Uh, this is a separate task. Well, it's going to be pretty exciting to find out. I, I think Absolutely. it's always nice to be able to say to existing owners that there is a good, strong reason compelling them to upgrade. And that really always feels like good value to me when a product is delivered at a similar price point to the predecessor, because then the customer feels rewarded rather than punished for staying with an idea. I, I can honestly say if you are an owner of the current model of this car, you're going to be really delighted by all of the development that's taken place. Now, I might sound a little bit biased because I might be sitting next to the guy who's responsible for that, but I have driven the predecessor extensively. And I have to be honest, there were a few niggles about that car for me, mostly because whilst it looked stunning on the road, I felt the compromises required in order to produce that vehicle. In this car, I'm not feeling any compromise at all. Now, I have to ask, we have two rear seat passengers with us. I'm not sure if we can pick them up. That's our cameraman, Thomas, and also another friendly chap from Mercedes. What I'm really keen to know, chap, sitting back there, how is the rear experience? Because on the predecessor, again, could have been a bit more comfortable. What do you think, Thomas? Um, I've got a lot of space. <clears throat> I think I've got this very, very impressive because uh, when you take a look uh, out of the windscreen, you will see how the body uh, moves to the curves. So it's uh, really incredible to sit uh, in the rear and uh, to drive. Excellent. So, good comfort in the front, good comfort in the back, everything working nicely together. But I know because of the product life cycle, you are already having thoughts about what didn't make the cut for the development of this car that you are now thinking about for the next car. It seems to me that the major challenge here is just how much of a coupe drive can you deliver in an SUV? <laughs> is that fair? Yes, absolutely. And I really want to show you. So if you have a little bit more time, I can show you what, what a kind of power, what sportiness here is inside this car. I'm very excited even, to see it. Even you have the comfort. And we started here with the with a curve mode, so with a preview camera, which you see that that just looking at the car, the front is bumping and all is reacting. And here, with the really bad conditions, even with 22 inch, very comfortable ride. Uh, and this, uh, the body is very stable, so we feel very comfortable altogether. And when we will pass this car, we have a diff two, uh, three different other driving modes, so. You see that the reaction, look the reaction of the car, even how fast the system compensate the the uh, the the energy which that was given by the by changing the steering wheel and the engines. And when I will change now here, for example, to sport mode, you see a little bit. You f you hear a little bit more. Oh, it's a roaring from the diesel engine. So we have an active sound system on board, which which. If you drive in comfort mode, it should be in the back really low because comfortable is all the issue for noise. But you see, and the reaction of the car in sport, and I will, I will show you, it is like... <laughs> and it's still stable. You don't feel, <laughs> you don't feel something that the body is moving. It's still stable. Right, and give me a second, but it's very dangerous here, so you cannot overtake only if it's possible. But we can we can move with this car. Um, you can, so it's very stable. That the focus here from for for uh, for the team was to to get the drivability. What is the drivability of a coupe? 
the customers are coming from other coupes, from sedan coupes or something like this. So they expect it that it's not just a copy of the GLE. They want to have their own car. It should it should be have the drivability like it looks. And this car looks fast, even if it stands still. And here we go. Lovely. Now, if you haven't driven one of these before, I think that description really hits the nail on the head of what wasn't ideal with the predecessor, was that it was a GLE with a less practical body shape on it. So it looked great, but it was never delivering the drive that the visuals promised. I think as we've just seen over the past 45 seconds, this car's a little bit of a different beast. Yeah. And you can very smooth, very easily, and feel really still very comfort. Even we are going with an SUV in this dimension. Look, I'm going this one, and I'll react this one. So this is just a very, very easy way to have. This is a 400D coupe, so it drives very fast. Can you but talk it's very about stable. The, about the pairing between the engine and the gearbox. Yeah, that was. We have the over the the main system is our electronic stability uh, uh, system, and he controls everything. So if we are driving now here in sport mode, we have some other limits where the active system is controlling the car, and it's it's communicate. The communication is between the engine, between the acceleration pedal between the gearbox and between our torque on demand system because our torque on demand system is fully capable to to control the the torque from the rear and to the front mm. and therefore if we find out that the car is the main target is being neutral as long as possible and if you are for example you see here doing like this doing like this you know you can really the car is reacting immediately even we are fully loaded mm. uh, and that is based on that our now we are driving only in 4x2 mode you know that you see here on the screen it's only the torque on the rear so the the capability of the front wheels are maximum focused on for the steering angle to to move the car in the right direction. Immediately reaction on the driver's wish to change the direction. So without rolling issues of the body. That was the main target and that is a system. We have different power. We have a six um, uh, uh, um, new technology, a very high technology of the uh, uh, brake system in the car and it's very fast, so that allows us to have other limits in this coupe than in the previous versions or in the old GLE. Is the gearbox new? No, it's a, the gearbox is a 9G Tronic. Uh, it's exactly the same like the other one, but it, the program is adapted for the coupe. So the points of changing the gears is, you see, if we are, we are coming out of a curve, we don't have to search. So whenever we break down, we reduce the speed. So the system automatically find in the right gear, you know, not searching for, okay, what, what, which gear is now uh, the right one is there. Even I'm driving in without any manual change of the gearbox. And this gearbox is across the range. Yes. That's Absolutely. good to know. That's good to know. I think one of the nice advantages that you've been able to take take advantage of in the redesign is use a lot of tried and te test excuse me use a lot of tried and tested technology and build on it to make it more focused and specific exactly for this car exactly and that 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 close the 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 issue when we have the the blank sheet is you have on this first idea the first technology you choose has to include all the different variants at the beginning. You cannot start developing a coupe just, okay, let's do it after we finish the car, mm. then something is missing. Mm. And as I mentioned, 
the wheelbase, the decision of the wheelbase was very clear and this is the entry for getting these performance and for uh, a special dri drivability of the GLE Coupe. So 30% now of overall total Mercedes-Benz sales are SUVs. Is that a number you see increasing over time? Yes, I think so. Because it's, look, an SUV is giving the customers really a usability that is really great. So winter, summer, room, space, and the safety. And the safety issue is just if you are on the road and between the other cars and uh, passing a commercial truck a big, with big wheels, 18-wheeler in the US, so you feel a little bit more safe. And the, a car is maybe the second highest investment in your life after a house or something. So therefore, if you got more for same money, why you don't? Chooses. So it's a little bit like we have on the automotive industry, we have to work to make it more capable, reduce fuel consumption, the electrification of the cars, which is now starting all the SUV segment you see, uh, very successful there. And we will here have a plug in hybrid also for the GLE Coupe. So, uh, 2020. 2020. 2020. I think that's going to be a very exciting vehicle. What's interesting to me is the idea that as customers are migrating from standard cars to larger SUVs, I think all of the manufacturers now are, are really working to meet that demand to say, okay, well, just because this is your traditional car that you would pick, we now need to offer you a version of this as an SUV. And what's really exciting to be able to look at is that for the first time I'm feeling some of that driving experience that really is unique or was unique to the car is now available in the SUV rather than just the styling. So you must have had an immense amount of fun working on this project. <laughs> Absolutely. And seeing just how much you could squeeze into this thing. Yeah. Was there anything that you found particularly challenging about the job where you thought, ah, we, th we didn't realize just how difficult it would be to achieve that? Well, at the end, it was our uh, EABC system. This innovation is, you see, it is absolutely incredible. And we found out a lot of things which uh, we didn't know before. But during the development, of course, it was the first system in the world. And therefore, every day we got new information and we are learning. We are still learning and found out some new features which we are now capable to introduce in the car for example with the gasoline engine you will have the in the s plus program driving program although integrates now the curve mode so we get, we we are now able to give more safety even driving in an s plus sports mode with the curve program to feel like a little bit like a motorcycle and that's wow. all the new for this car. Wow, it's crazy. Motorcycles becoming more like cars, cars <laughs> becoming more like motorcycles. I'm gonna stick with the car for now. Yeah. <laughs> so, across the engine lineup, what would be your pick? What do you have most fun with personally? Well, I think the engine lineup is we're having uh, six cylinder diesels in two versions. We are, we are, we'll, um, we'll offer the six cylinder a gasoline version with a 48 voltage. So my personal um, is, it's difficult to say because look, if you have really a long ride and you don't have really, don't want to refill, take the diesel engine. It's a long distance car, very smooth, and it's capable. The torque, if you're driving here uh, through the mountains, the torque is immediately available, even if it's a little bit quiet in the car, just talk the power. Uh, on the other hand, the gasoline engine with the sound of a exhaust system would also makes fun. <laughs> so therefore, I'm, I'm frankly, I would say, I'm happy because I have the solution to change. Right. <laughs> Every time. Well, I'm reading this, obviously one of the customer's biggest concerns has been everything that's fallen out about diesel and all of the manufacturers have a lot to do to win back trust in terms of how that is presented at market. Well, not only are the diesel engines now Euro 6D, but I read also that you have a unique and new dosage system. 
to make those emissions even cleaner still. Yes, Could you're you right. Tell us a little about how that works. Well, it is it is a combination of active and passive uh, systems here in the exhaust system, and that gives us the opportunity. We fulfill with every diesel engine from the GLE platform. We fulfill the emission regulations RDE two. 6D, so not 60 temp, 60, and that is our our message to our customers that they when they when they buy this car they have a car which is capable all the for future emission regulation because we are we we fulfill these and you see there's a we did a lot of investment here really to do all what we can to support the environment and and all these issue. But the diesel is still a very, a very important engine and the customer likes diesel. So therefore, what we can do, do everything what is possible on, from the technical side. And therefore, the exhaust system is very complex, a lot of different filters. And um, so we are happy that we can deliver RDE2 Euro 60. Now, one of the nice features of the car that we haven't actually touched on yet is the way that the Mercedes-Benz UX system is integrated into it. I would say pretty much effortlessly, both in terms of how it's styled and also how it functions. You have so much information available to you about this car and its performance. How much of that is accessible through talking to the system rather than physically pressing buttons? Um. Well, I think the, the, the speech, the voice recognition to, 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 to communicate with the MBUX, there are still every month they are getting on the servers more information. But for the functionality of the car, we have a clear, clear strategy. Every function which is, you know, which influence the drivability of the car is not available by speech because the driver don't want that someone from the back is just talking, okay, yeah. change drive program. Yes. And this has to be controlled. And this, you have to be active, put the button even on the system, even on the touch screen or whatever. Uh, for all the others, well, for comfort issues, like massage or radio or something, this is in the system. And what we create here with the MBUX is a big advantage. You see here the bump you never feel. <laughs> I, it's impressive. It's impressive when you're going there and you don't feel it. <laughs> it's, just, it's really a genuine shame you can't see the state of some of these roads. But uh, it, it, it is doing a very, very good job. This air suspension is doing a superb job of giving us a nice, level, comfortable driving experience. And that was what, what exactly the point, how, how we explain technique in the car and therefore we use here the screen to explain because most of our customers are not expert like we you know they are just okay if you if you drive here and say well everything is fine because he's not really interested and, and not, he cannot fully understand what is behind this mm. that the comfort is like it is and therefore we create here these screens to show how the system is working. It's not only because talking about uh, um, uh, air suspension, talking about EA active body control, that is a word. And here you can see, you can see your, your, your friends, you can explain and say, wow. And it's very easy to understand because it's really a reduce of some main, main functions that you can really recognize, oh, great. And that the MBUX, so we have for every driving program a special screen here which shows how the car is working and the chassis is doing his, his, his job. This is a much higher definition resolution as well than the predecessor, I think. Thomas, how, how does it look from back there? Is it crisp and clean back there too? Yes, totally crisp and clean. Really nice. Ah, that's actually very nice. I always like when some thought has been put into how systems present to the rear passengers as well. And especially now I can see that it is actually nice to sit back there with the additional <laughs> headspace. It looks good. So we've checked out the sporty driving. We've checked out the comfort. How is the economy? Are you brave enough to give me a live figure on what this car is delivering you right now? Wait, wait one week. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so maybe that was one ask too far. But I think it's always nice to get a real world usage on the 
the figures because we all know how the fuel efficiency numbers are arrived at is different from market to market, manufacturer to manufacturer, and it can make it very frustrating for the consumers to get a realistic understanding of exactly what sort of usage they're going to be able to get. How does the usage of this vehicle compare with the predecessor? Well, um, I think that the the um, the usage. Well, let's say it gives more fun drivability. It has a better for the trunk space, a better usage of the trunk space. We optimize because we get feedback. There are minor issues from the old one, but we got the feedback. We 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 did some changes here because the trunk is now better reachable. It's not so high. It was a little bit too high, but now you can move down the whole car up to 50 millimeters. We reduce the 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 trunk level about 60 millimeters overall. So therefore, in this easy space, we have a new a new uh, just um, um, to cover the trunk. Uh, we have a new uh, concept there, which is easy to use. You have more space in the rear. You have more space in all these stuff here. Uh, and well, I think overall and drivability and comfort as mentioned. So I think you got really, really value for money. How is the fuel efficiency in this versus the predecessor? Um, the fuel efficiency, it will be really less. Will be than, less? Will be less than the predecessor, definitely. I think it's obviously important to note that nobody should be buying this car for its fuel efficiency number but it's always nice to see that improve over time. I'm assuming the wind resistance has a really big factor on that, but the drive assistance programs as well are making the car operate more efficiently. And if I understand it correctly, this uh, system that we have on this car is also recuperative as well. Uh, yes, but it is not the same level like the integrated starter generator, that for sure. Still, Every little bit of energy saved is another little bit of extra money in your pocket for the options, which I'm sure you're going to want to spend on. Now, we can't play it for you, obviously, because of rights, but I'm really keen to know what you think of the sound system. Well, let's move a little bit. You can feel it now. You can feel it roaring even here. There we go. And that is a diesel, you know. It, yeah, it is. It, it 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 should not sound like something synthetic. It should be a true. It should be very low noise if you're driving in comfort mode, very smooth. Because if you have a hard day in in the business, you don't want to have any noise right now. You have to be quiet, going home quiet, or with your family on the auto, on the motorway. But if you're alone. Have you met my family? <laughs> driving, <laughs> driving along quiet. On the, that's not their style, I have to tell you. But the benefit okay. of their having the sound insulation on the car is that other people may not experience my children driving down the uh, uh, maybe. But, but look, it's like, like you're feeling it like a bit like, oh, it's getting a little bit pressure on your blood, right? Mm. If you're alone and because it's, it's still the whole car the customer is feeling the whole concept. It's not feeling only the engine. It's not feeling only how the acceleration is, is the car is doing the acceleration mode or something else. It just, to get a feeling, I'm feeling fine. And, and it's, it's, it's like, a, well, a little bit like from the beginning, from the design, from the first view, when you, when you go to the car, say, it's mine, you know? So your ideal customer response, I'm guessing, is that the customer looks at the car and says, wow. The customer gets in the car and says, wow. The customer drives the car and says, wow. The customer goes home to pick up their partner and their partner doesn't really necessarily notice quite how much sporty drive is available because they are saying, wow, the comfort. Exactly. That's, that's the ideal response. That's the idea. That's the whole, the whole car in total. So. It makes no sense. Our philosophy not only focused on one issue, one item. Okay, that's, can you feel it? So I hope I don't have to explain you the programs. You feel it when we change it. Mm. And that is very important for us. And if the driver is changing the driving program, it should immediately feel something happened with the car. And 
in if you're driving in 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 comfort mode the first priority of the car is comfort if you're driving in sport the first priority is sport so give me everything the car is capable to give because i want to do exactly a very hard or very sporty drive well thank you very much you're for taking the time to show us Obviously, I'm more than a bit excited to get behind the wheel myself, but I think I might have to wait just a bit longer for that. Exactly. Well, if you didn't think that the GLE Coupe was quite enough for you, don't worry, AMG have a plan for you as well. Given their usual proclivity for snippy titles, meet the AMG GLE 53 4Matic Plus Coupe. I will admit AMG have faced some easier challenges. Usually they take a standard Mercedes and they really beef it up to show all of the sporty components of what it could be. Well, obviously the GLE Coupe was pretty aggressively sporty to start with. So AMG kind of had to go big or go home. Look at this. They needed to make a very clean statement right off the bat. Yes, it's the GLE Coupe, but it's even more. It's an AMG. So gone is the horizontal bar and in with these vertical ones, making a big, bold statement. Coming down slightly lower, you can see how they've beefed up the appearance of the front with these air curtains. And they just add a little bit of dynamism to the overall design that gives it just a little bit more of an aggressive punch. So this is a development car. AMG were very keen to point out that aesthetically, this engine isn't quite done with. But there's no way that we were coming to look at this and not showing you how it sits within the compartment anyway. What you are looking at is a significant upgrade on the standard GLE. This is a three litre beast kicking out 435 horsepower. Now the torque numbers are a little bit confusing because of the electric system the 48 volt electric system that this car has on board as well. So we're gonna to talk to an expert about that and get a clearer idea of how that power is delivered. But meanwhile, isn't it a lovely treat to see an engine that clearly has a bay big enough to accommodate all of the power that you want to throw at it. We have been joined by Stefan Novak, who's the project manager for AMG Mercedes, GLE, GLS, G-Class, and I think that's everything. That's Does that about sound good? It. That sounds pretty good. Now, my first question for you is, obviously the nature of AMG is to take a Mercedes and to make it as sporty as it possibly can be. Is that a fair assessment? That is a fair assessment. So this car for me represents a particularly interesting challenge because you're taking a car that is already designed to be agile, sporty, aggressive, the styling, the engines, the performance, the handling, but you have to do more with it. Yeah. So a lot of people might look at it and say, come on, that's just the engine and the trim, but you've changed a lot about this car. Yeah, in order to achieve what you just said, uh, what is really our uh, target, um, to make this car a pure uh, AMG, a car that has the DNA of AMG, um, we developed our own front axle to start with. Um, so basically for the um, regular GLE Cube, the cradle is attached um, with um, mounts. We attached uh, our cradle uh, directly to the body 
which gives us a much more precise uh, handling there. Uh, we lowered the lower control arm by 20 millimeters and by that we achieve a different uh, rolling axle of the vehicle. So uh, we have much more car-like handling. This is, this is the, the target that we fulfill. Um, and that um, together with uh, our own Elasta kinematics on the axle uh, gives us uh, a really precise ride on, on the vehicle as you might experience. So right now we're in comfort mode, uh, which on this bad road gives you uh, a decent ride. And if you go to Sport or uh, Sport Plus, uh, the vehicle changes its behavior. Um, that is because uh, with the driving programs uh, you influence the shifting behavior of the transmission, uh, your uh, reaction of the engine, um, your AMG dynamics, which uh, summarizes all of the driving uh, characteristics of your um, transfer case, for example, which is a variable. You can split your torque uh, completely to the rear axle or 50-50 uh, towards the front. Um, and basically that uh, together with the suspension and your uh, AMG uh, ride control, uh, active ride control, which is basically your uh, torsion bars that have an electromechanic uh, actuator. Uh, so you're able to uh, really have the car in a, in a dynamic, uh, that is pretty fascinating. So all pretty basic fundamental physics and car design, pretty simple stuff to keep up with. Here's what I want to know. You all work together, obviously, yeah. but would you say that the first priority is to look at what you can achieve with the engine within the car or what you can achieve with the chassis, which will then dictate how much power you can put into the car? Um. I think that work, that works uh, hand in hand. Um, you, you, uh, we have our our engines, um, as you know. The this uh, inline six uh, also is uh, available in an E53 or a CLS uh, 53, um, and so it it perfectly fits also in in this vehicle, um, and we want to have each vehicle with its uh, characteristics. So um, we are uh, taking the, the power of the engine um, and uh, using that into a package of this vehicle that is an AMG. So it's not about uh, just uh, uh, acceleration. It is about uh, driving uh, a sports car but you must have some occasions when uh, in, in concert with Mercedes development they'll say okay we've got one of these future models coming to you and one of the engine guys says oh I would love to put this engine in that car and the engineers say ah but it can't work the physics can't work that's too much power it's taking it too far for this chassis um, yeah, basically we are in, in very early contact with our colleagues of uh, of serious development. So at the time of their specification book, we are already involved. So we have the chance to discuss our needs uh, for the um, for the coming project. Uh, and that's what we do. Uh, we are in close uh, discussions on what we do need to turn our ideas into reality. And for sure, uh, it must, uh, not all the times, it is able to be brought into the base uh, version, but occasionally we uh, make some uh, things that can be adapted that basically are foreseen in the in the base vehicle and that are able to be uh, adapted in production, uh, so that we are enforcing the vehicle where we need it. For this vehicle, for example. Um, I, I told you about the transfer case uh, uh, bringing up to 100% in the rear and we are uh, more uh, rear drive oriented. For that reason we developed our own uh, rear axle differential with a larger gear in order to, ex to exactly achieve that. 
to have um, a, a solid ride over a vehicle's lifetime and uh, or a solid uh, component back there. Uh, we were uh, not uh, lucky to find uh, any uh, um, matching component in, in the existing, so uh, we built our own. And that's something uh, that we do. Uh, we are following uh, our ideals to, to bring a car uh, to the road that uh, satisfies our customers. So the engine power management of this system means we have a standard engine and we have a 48 volt electrical system as well. And this is where it starts getting confusing because if we look at the most powerful of the diesel engines on the standard model, it gives us 700 newton meters of torque. This engine produces 520 newton meters of torque. The electrical system can give you an extra 250, but, and this is where I need your help, that doesn't mean that this car has 770 newton meters of torque available. No, uh, because one is a combustion engine that develops the torque uh, over RPMs and the other is an electric engine that develops the torque. Um, uh, basically, at the moment you add electricity, but then it degrades uh, over RPMs. So it is uh, really that the, the EcoBoost system supports you in, in uh, starting the car, in, in uh, initial uh, acceleration, um, but then uh, it degrades when uh, your combustion engine uh, kicks up so it's not uh, valid to say uh, you have uh, this plus that you have both in the car and they are overlaying uh, but not uh, in a in an absolutely additional uh, way I think that says something interesting both about where we're moving to in technology terms and also the difficulty of communicating ideas to customers because I think people for a long time understand horsepower, they understand newton meters. And once we move into slightly more exciting driving style, <laughs> we have a bit of clear road. So I think I'm gonna change the conversation for a moment just okay. so I can hear more about what this car is doing when we push it a little bit harder. So talk me through how the car is behaving. Okay. The car is, uh, the, what, what really, um, all these uh, things we were talking about, uh, sum up in a really precise behaving. You have a really good feeling on where you are, what you uh, are going into and where your your limits are. So it's uh, it doesn't uh, let you in a, uh, with a question on can I do that or can I not. Um, it shows you where we are and where we are going. And so that really gives you um, a unique driving experience. For an SUV, it's surprising how low the center of gravity, gravity, the center of gravity feels when you're powering around these corners. Uh, that's what I uh, um, tried to uh, get uh, at the beginning with the axle. What we did with a lower uh, uh, adaption of the or. Uh, of the control arms of the lowers uh, on the front axle, um, that we have a different uh, uh, roll axis through the way, through the vehicle, which uh, results in exactly that, and that's worth the, all the the efforts. Everything coming together to deliver the best performance that you can get from the car. Yeah, it's very pleasing to experience because it's not just, I think the, the most important point is it's not just raw power. It really is the application of control, how you manage to get the best out of that power once you have it available to you. Yeah, because, um, you know, it, it wouldn't satisfy uh, our customers or our boss if you would just go longitudinal. So uh, if you're not making it through the curve, you're slow. And, uh, and you feel unsafe, and that's not something that uh, a customer expects from AMG. So talking about AMG customers, what would you say is the defining feature over somebody who takes out a GLE coupe and says, yeah, that's great, but I think 
I want a little more. What is it that AMG speaks to in their customer base? Um, basically, I think an AMG in every uh, car is a very exclusive product. Um, it has not just uh, one feature. It is you have when you enter the car, you feel you're an AMG. You're having the AMG seats that give you uh, a good uh, uh, hold, uh, also in, in this driving or dynamics on the cor on the, uh, these curves uh, that we are driving. Um, you're having the AMG steering wheel, which is a little more solid, um, with these satellites here, uh, where you can influence your driving programs or you can toggle through um, functions that you can uh, influ uh, switch directly on the steering wheel. Um, your uh, exterior, uh, you already uh, told that you, you are showing um, that you're uh, owning something very special because it is uh, the, the AMG grill, it is part of the AMG family. Um, and so it is a, a variety of, of measures that we bring into the car and that our customers um, like. Uh, and uh, uh, I think uh, it's not one uh, feature that makes the customer uh, buy that. It's the, the, the whole uh, bundle that you get and that makes uh, this car very special. Well, I must admit to being slightly intrigued about what comes next. You've managed to achieve something that I didn't think was possible and that's really delivering a coupe driving style without compromising on comfort, without compromising on the drive in an SUV package. I, I really have to take my hat off to you. My question would be, you know, what comes next? Are you gonna tell me that it's possible to have all of that available in a G-Wagon as well? <laughs> are we going to be tearing round corners in one of those at some point? Well, um, I, I think you have to had the chance to drive uh, the uh, new G-Wagon with its new individual front axle. Uh, and it is, uh, like, if you compare that uh, to its predecessor, it is a, a completely new car without uh, giving in its uh, character. So it, it still has been... Uh, uh, or we used to be managed uh, to, to transform the character from the past into uh, the, the G-Wagon. So it is still unique body style. It is still uh, some kind of enhanced driving and it is still a G-Wagon. Uh, it only uh, has much more uh, preciseness in, in, in driving. And so that's basically the genes of, of AMG that we try to uh, bring into uh, each and every car on a uh, level that the car uh, that is dedicated to the car. It's not um, uh, like the same thing that we uh, uh, spread over the same uh, of our car lines. We, we make it individually in order to achieve um, a sound package for uh, yeah, so the we, model. We know that the world and the market are moving towards SUVs ever increasing rate. 30% of your current lineup, or Mercedes I should say, current lineup is now SUV sales. Are you convinced, Is are you still in love with the car or are you already bought and sold? Are you an SUV guy and that's you? Uh, basically I am. Uh, I'm uh, for, for the past 18 years responsible for the project of the AMG's uh, SUVs of the large ones. But you um, must be pretty excited now because we're finally coming into a space so for 18 years, you've been telling people, no, really, they can be good. They can be good. And people have been saying, come on. Uh, basically, they have been good every uh, car for uh, the time it's of its being. Uh, and this is basically with uh, what we can do today. Uh, I think we made a, a large step in, into uh, where we want to be and where uh, you have everything. You have a SUV roominess, uh, but you have a, a sports car like driving. Right. So, come on, AMG V-Class. Uh, people, people bus. 
you've got to look for bigger challenges next. <laughs> well, we uh, for, for the V-Class, we do have an IMG line for customers who want to go uh, sporty, but uh, I haven't heard of anything uh, else than that. Well, I guess the next exciting step across all of the lines will be the full electrification. Is that something that you look forward to with excitement or is there a little bit of you that thinks, no, you can't deliver this unless it's with the engine still? Uh, we have to look into uh, various uh, uh, opportunities for the future. And um, I personally think um, that there are opportunities for, for both uh, uh, a combustion engine uh, or, and electric driving. Uh, in, in a combination like is, you see it here or uh, however uh, we might come up with. But um, right now we are satisfied with that uh, pretty much. Well, the future looks pretty exciting. And if this car is anything to go by, then I think there's an awful lot to look forward to. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us and thank you for showing us one of the most exciting models coming out of AMG anytime soon. Watch out for it. So that about does it for us and our time here in Romania. So what did we think about the GLE Coupe? Well, there are those who think that an SUV should be an SUV and a Coupe should be a Coupe. And I'm not gonna lie, I think I probably am one of those people. But if you're somebody who loves the Coupe style and wants to know, is it realistically possible to get that and the matching performance in an SUV? Well, there I have to take my hat off to Mercedes. This car for me is an extraordinary technological achievement. It delivers far more of a coupe driving style in an SUV shell than I honestly believed was possible. Why? Well, it's so much higher and bigger than a coupe really is in order to deliver what you want from the drive. But there is so much technology happening in this car. It's extraordinary and you really have to drive it to believe just what it's capable of achieving. Now, all of that said, it's not only the technology that's a massive leap forwards in this car. Having the insight to design this from fresh and making it a shorter platform than the GLE on which it's based is a complete revelation. This car is nothing like the GLE to drive, it's nothing like the GLE to own, but it does deliver you the comfort that you get from that model. So all of my criticisms of the predecessor are pretty much completely gone. That has been fixed in every single respect. And for that reason, it really is a remarkable achievement. Visually, well, let's be honest, the style's either gonna work for you or it isn't. So when I give you my comments here, it is based on expectation of this particular model. If you're gonna go with an SUV in a coupe style, I think this is probably getting close to about as good as you can make it look. It has to be big and bold in the front. It has to be svelte and sleek throughout the side and the rear. Well, I'm still not seeing exactly what you're going to do to solve that particular problem, but it does look completely unique. And I think for a lot of owners or prospective owners of this vehicle, that is going to be a huge selling point. Pricing, well, we don't have the numbers yet, but I'm pretty sure you can imagine it's going to be fairly eye-watering. And so it should be. After all, if you own one of these, you don't want to see five or six of them on the school run. You want to be the only person driving it. And the best part is you really want to be able to say to somebody when they get into that passenger seat for the first time, I bet you think you know how this car's going to drive, don't you? Well, I bet you're going to be surprised. And that's my response to this vehicle. It's an absolute delight compared to its predecessor. I like the styling there, but for me, that was a bit of a gimmick. This is a wholly credible car and it delivers very, very special things from its drive. But hopefully we're going to get to show you a lot more of that soon when Thomas takes it out for its full review. Thank you for joining us here today. I hope you've had a good time watching and we hope that we'll see you all again soon.